Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Rotary meeting of Monday, February 22nd. Um, I will now call upon Jan to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. Dr. David Hale holds the Lawson Professorship in Diabetes Research and is a professor in the Departments of Medicine, Physiology and Pharmacology and Pediatrics at Western University. He is Scientific Director of Lawson Health Research Institute and the Integrated Vice President, Research for London Health Services Center and St. Joseph's Healthcare in London. Dr. Hill was educated at the University of Nottingham and at Worcester College, University of Oxford. He has published over 200 scientific papers and maintains an active program in diabetes research and stem cell biology. He is a recipient of the CDA's Frederick G. Banting Award, as well as the Medal of the Society for Endocrinology from the UK. Dr. Hill was inducted as a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences in 2011. Dr. Hill's research center on the generation of new insulin producing beta cells in the pancreas as a strategy for the reversal of diabetes. Please welcome Dr. David Hill. Thank you very much, Jan. I'm just going to uh, share my screen. While you're doing that, Dr. Hill, I will just yeah. make a few other announcements that you sure. don't know when you're able to share. Um, so for the club, um, a quick update on the Polio Plus initiative of Rotary International. Um, some of you will already be aware of this or seen this news in the last week or two. Uh, in Malawi last two weeks ago, they reported a new polio case in the wild uh, for the first time in over five years in Africa, um, which isn't good news, but it's not necessarily bad news. The one polio case in the wild was actually genetically linked to a strain of polio virus um, from Pakistan in October 2019. So it is an imported case of polio from Pakistan and not a case of polio or a strain of polio that is endemic to Africa. So Africa is still polio free, despite um, a case being reported last week. Um, in Afghanistan, uh, there's also more news. Um, earlier, I guess late last year was my last update on Polio Plus. Um, and at that point in time, I think we had just one case of wild polio virus in Afghanistan, or two cases in 2021. Unfortunately, um, between everything that happened um, when the Taliban took over and the end of the polio campaigns, there was an actual total of four cases of wild polio in Afghanistan in 2021, as well as one case of polio already this year in 2022. The national or the nationwide uh, immunization campaigns resumed in November of 2021, but unfortunately last week the campaigns took a hit when eight healthcare workers were killed as part of an incident in Afghanistan. So things not going particularly well in Afghanistan, still better than back in 2019, uh, but uh, a number of setbacks in Afghanistan. The third country, and this is probably where we are the most, help, the most hopeful, is the total number of wild polio virus cases in Pakistan in 2021 was only that one case back in January or February. And there have been no cases this year. And uh, we're hoping that that zero cases or that last case in 2021 will be the last case in Pakistan ever. So that is a quick polio plus update. Dr. Hill. Any no, I'm not, I'm not having any luck, but you know what? I don't really need slides. I'm just going to go ahead. Okay. So I, uh, I'd like to give you a bit of an update about uh, uh, what's uh, going on in Lawson and um, particularly some of the uh, exciting research that's come out in the last um, uh, couple of years. Uh, as you know, we are uh, a research institute representing hospital-based research in LHSC and St. Joseph's. And we, uh, we have research activity going on at all of the major hospital sites. So Victoria Hospital, uh, University Hospital, uh, the Parkwood Institute site of St. Joseph's and St. Joseph's at, uh, at uh, Grosvenor Street. 
And um, your research is really a core activity of an academic health sciences center. And uh, we, have, we have two academic health sciences centers in London, uh, LHSE and St. Joseph's, and they have a very special role in the health system. Yes, they provide excellence and in innovation of patient care, but they also have to provide excellence and in innovation in education to train the next generations of health professionals, not just physicians, but all of the allied health professionals, nurses as well. Uh, they have a special mandate in research and innovation because really that is the future of our health system. And then increasingly they have a system role. So as we go to a more integrated regional model of uh, delivery of healthcare, then the academic hospitals really have to be fulcrums around which other health providers uh, connect. So we have a seamless delivery of care uh, from the hospitals out to uh, other uh, health providers, be it long-term care, primary health care, community hospitals, et cetera. So within our research um, and innovation mission, um, we have the mandate to, you know, to discover, to discover new knowledge, but also to translate that into care. So it's, uh, it goes a step further than, for instance, a university, uh, which lives or dies by its publication record, its, uh, you know, its metrics on gathering finances, et cetera. Our mandate is to discover, but also to see that translated into, uh, into care. Uh, we also have a, an important training role for developing the next scientists, uh, the next generation of scientists, be they graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, uh, medical residents, and also to continue to continue uh, to educate um, our health professionals in the latest technology around uh, research. So training the next generation is very, very important. And then finally, we have to show the return on investment of research to our funders. And uh, that could be the federal government, the provincial government, uh, but also numerous charities, uh, uh, health charities like the Heart and Stroke Foundation or Diabetes Canada, uh, but also back to our community because we are incredibly well supported by our community through the, uh, the hospital-based foundations, LHSC Foundation, St. Joe's Foundation, the Children's Health Foundation. So, we are part of a network of 20 hospitals in, um, in Ontario that are these academic health science centers. And collectively in the research realm, we employ 21,000 people in hospital-based research. And we generate $1.75 billion worth of activity each year. And most of that money is coming in from outside the province of Ontario. It's coming through from the federal government, international contracts, business contracts, et cetera. So uh, if you actually look at us in terms of our workforce, uh, we're actually bigger than the auto industry in, in Ontario. Uh, we often don't get the same profile as that, unfortunately. So if collectively for all of the Ontario um, research hospitals, we are handling almost 5,000 new clinical research studies every year. That not only generates uh, new knowledge for improved healthcare, but it also has an economic benefit. So on average, we generate about 240 notices of invention every year, which then go forward for assessment as to are the uh, intellectual property uh, protectable. And last year we generated 122 new um, commercialization opportunities within the Ontario hospitals. And they could be spin-off companies, they could be licensing of uh, uh, technologies associated with royalty streams, et cetera. So for Lawson, our little part of that is um, we on average uh, have about two and a half thousand active clinical studies going on at any one time. And we add to that at about 500 new ones a year. So some finished, some new ones to taken on. And the turnover is about 500 new clinical studies coming online every year. And an average year, we, we recruit around 9,000 patients from the two hospitals into our clinical studies. And that is an opportunity to receive the next generation of healthcare long before it's actually provided through the Ministry of Health through the provincial budget. So for some patients, the only treatment they have available 
is going to be a research protocol. For instance, for a cancer patients that exhausted all of the normal treatments, and you know, unfortunately, it's not really impacted the progress of their disease, often the last thing is the research protocol. So it is very, very important we have that option available for our patients here in London. So, so Lawson has an average uh, a turnover now of uh, about $135 million we spend on research each year. And that ranks us in, at least in sort of financial terms, as the eighth largest hospital institute in, um, in Canada. And in Ontario, where we could be fourth, we could be fifth. We don't, I haven't seen the, this next year's um, uh, data yet. But when it comes to patent generation nationally, we're actually number six. We're the sixth best producer of new intellectual property and commercialization opportunities in, uh, in Canada, in the hospital uh, research um, sector. So we employ a lot of people. We've got about 600 people that we call really the scientists. Um, all of them are affiliated with Western University. They all contribute teaching to the university as well and are full part of our academic community. Um, and if you add on then the, all of the support staff for research and our administration services, you're up to about 2,400 people who call Lawson their workplace. So we're actually one of the city's larger um, employers uh, as well. So our, the, the type of research we do is very much pro, uh, problem based. So really everything starts with the clinic. So there's a wicked problem. There's, a, a, you know, there's, a, there's an obstacle. We can't give the patient the outcome we are, would ideally like. So that then becomes the research topic. We look around for funding. This could come from public sources. It could be a partnership with industry. Um, and we put together a team to tackle that problem. And pretty much that is our, that is our fundamental research model. In some cases, we start with molecules. So we actually do discovery. We do cell work. We do animal testing. So uh, animal models of, uh, of human diseases. Um, but quite often, we don't actually do the discovery ourselves, but we are the agent of testing in our patient population. So this testing could be new drugs coming out from the pharma industry. It could be new medical devices. And Lawson is the sort of environment where we road test those in clinical trials. Um, and ultimately, those new products will you know, be um, commercialized and hopefully, if they're effective, taken up by funders such as the, uh, the Ministry of Health for the benefit of, uh, of our patients. But ultimately, our raison d'etre is to maximize the opportunities through research and discovery to our patient population. That's our immediate one in London, but also because we work on an international stage, it's to make that information available throughout Canada and ultimately throughout the, the world. Um, the type of research we do is very much team-based research. So um, one skill set isn't enough to tackle these really important questions that we, we seek to find answers for. So certainly we need um, medical skills. We also need basic science skills, but we also need nursing skills. We need computer uh, science skills, whatever we need to actually address, uh, seriously address a, um, uh, you know, a, a problem that's holding up uh, what we think should be the best healthcare. Um, and our research at, at our education of our trainees is an important part of that because all of our graduate students, research fellows learn on the job. They are part of the research team and that's how they learn their trade. And then we'll go off to either to be independent researchers within the university or research institute system, or increasingly to go into other areas such as the pharma industry, uh, medical devices, uh, medical technologies, um, information management and artificial intelligence, a wide range of skills that now our trainees can take forward into the workplace. So because our two hospitals are really the providers of expert care, for the, really the whole of, of our catchment area of Southwest Ontario, um, pretty much up to Kitchener and then all the way down to Windsor. Um, and uh, you know, we are in many ways the only show in town. 
And therefore, all of the medical specialties uh, and surgical specialties are present in our two hospitals, and many of them have an associated research program. So for the London Health Sciences Center, we have strong research groups, for instance, in cardiology, in women's and children's health, critical illness research, because it's a trauma center, transplant, cancer, advanced uh, surgical, surgical procedures, um, kidney and neurosciences. Whereas on the St. Joseph side, we have the Parkwood Institute, which really houses you know, our mental health program, uh, geriatric medicine, including um, you know, cognitive diseases like Alzheimer's and other dementias, and the whole idea of mobility and rehabilitation, to getting people back to as mobile as they can be following uh, you know, a health issue. We have microbiology and urology. We have breast care. We have the, ha the hand and upper limb center at St. Joseph's, a very strong imaging program, and diabetes and endocrinology. And these all sort of sound like silos when I read them off, but they're not because they're all interactive. So the imaging group, you know, um, you know uh, collaborates with a cancer group, collaborates with a cardiology group. So it's, it, it's all of this team building um, enterprise to take on uh, individual problems that, uh, that we are facing in, the health, in future healthcare. We do have some programs that are not just do the, don't do, do the research, they act as resources for um, your great swathes of researchers. And there are sort of core, core technology platforms. So one is medical imaging, where we have, I think in London between robots and London, probably one of the top five imaging clusters in North America, um, covering all of the major imaging platforms. And of course, that is there then for the use of cancer researchers, cardiology researchers, children's health researchers, et cetera. Uh, another platform is informatics. The province of Ontario has a provincial database called the um, Institute of Clinical Evaluative Studies, ICS. And that houses all of the health interactions that occur in the province of Ontario through OHIP. So every time you have an OHIP event, a doctor sees you, there's a report on that and a billing associated with it. All of that data goes into one giant database. And there are five satellite uh, data centers. Um, one is called Western, ISIS Western, and, uh, and Lawson houses that at the Victoria Hospital. So that is a huge tool of information for data mining uh, to look at health outcomes. Uh, the third call we have is a series of specialist clinical trials facilities. We have one for cancer at Victoria Hospital, uh, one for first in human studies at um, University Hospital, and we have one at St. Joseph's, really, where, which is more for studies where you just need to sit a patient in a chair for a couple of hours, whereas at UH, we actually have 14 beds. We have a, a research ward with 14 beds on it. Um, that, again, is a resource for all of our clinical investigators, no matter what specialty they're in, that they can use that space and hire the staff to get their clinical studies um, done. And our fourth core technology is personalized therapeutics or personalized medicine. And that is all built around the fact that we all respond slightly differently to a drug based on our personal genetics. So that unit is able to actually look at each person's genetic singularities and then tailor made the right drug in the right dose at the right time to that patient. This greatly improves the, uh, the chances that the drug is going to be effective for an individual and we can avoid an awful lot of, um, of um, uh, uh, untoward events uh, and unexpected occurrences uh, of, of drugs in particular individuals. So that's sort of the architecture, if you like. So I'm just gonna go through a few of our you know, recent stories and all of these are taken from the Lawson website. So you can go on there and actually uh, look in more detail at all of these. They're all been taken, I think, pretty much from the last 12 months. Um, so the first one is, um, is how, do we, how do we pivot to COVID? So when COVID struck us sort of two years ago now, um, we shut down a lot of our um, normal research, um, partly because uh, we wanted people to work from home and also because a lot of people were actually redeployed into um, actually hospital care. 
But what we did keep going was what we called essential research. And that included COVID research. And within about three months of us you know, going into lockdown, we'd started up about 70 new clinical studies around COVID. And we played to our strengths. So we are a trauma center. We have you know, uh, intensive care units at, uh, at both University Hospital and uh, Victoria Hospital. And so we really concentrated on understanding why individuals were so sick and really evaluating a series of molecules that we had developed for other purposes, but we thought could be repurposed to really help survival in, in COVID. And that has been a very exciting journey. Um, firstly, the whole research process happened incredibly quickly uh, compared to our normal uh, you know, process and how long it takes to get a new study um, going. Uh, we had one group that looked very much at what was the virus doing to your body tissues. And they were sampling every day, I think, for six months from uh, sick patients in the ICU, taking blood, uh, taking samples of lung fluid, and then looking in exquisite detail at the molecules, the proteins that were in there. And out of that came, I think, the first important discovery around COVID, which was it didn't just affect your lung tissue. Um, this group showed that, in fact, a, one of the primary targets was aligning to your blood vessels. And so you actually had a, a cardiovascular problem as a result of COVID infection. And that is why I think we were starting to see those reports of a lot of clotting in individuals who had um, COVID. So um, this was understood. We published it very rapidly. And, um, you know, and, and then the treatment shifted you know, across the world to start to look at the cardiovascular implications as well as the respiratory implications. Uh, we also tested a number of novel molecules um, that uh, meant some of those are still ongoing because you actually do need a fair number of patients to uh, prove whether a molecule is effective or not. But um, I think we've probably come out with new indications for at least three molecules that before were not thought to be of, of value in a sort of acute respiratory disease like, uh, like COVID. So out of that work, uh, not only have we now published the papers, uh, studies are ongoing, um, but we also generated about, uh, I think, five provisional patents the last time I, I checked uh, around biosignatures uh, for patients with COVID, uh, from which you could predict who was likely to get very sick and end up in ICU, and who was probably just going to be mildly ill, because that's very important then for projecting um, your hospital resource um, needs for a particular patient. Uh, also on the sort of acute sickness, we have a research group that's worked for probably for 20 years now on sepsis, and sepsis is a killer. It's one of the biggest killers still in hospital care. Um, it's really multi-organ failure, uh, where you might get it starting off in the lung, but then your kidneys fail, your liver kale fails, your heart starts to, 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 you know, to show adverse effects. And there's really very little effective treatments for that at the moment. So the group at Lawson has started to look at some very simple solutions. And one they found was actually letting the patients inhale carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide, you'll think, well, that's bad news. You know, that's what comes out of the, the basement if, you, uh, if your heating system's not uh, serviced and, you know, silent killer, you'll die in your sleep. And so it is at high concentrations. But if you then dose at very low concentrations of carbon monoxide, you can actually um, dampen down the immune system and improve the survival from, from, from sepsis. Very simple, very cheap, very effective. One of the groups that's grown up over the last five years or so is, um, is a group that's looking at the gut microbiome. And um, this is sort of relatively new science that you know, we all have bacteria in our gut. Um, we sort of know that we should keep that in good homeostasis and you can have you know, a probiotic yogurt or whatever to improve the health of that. And that will certainly give you good GI health. 
what we're discovering now is that that can act, those bacteria are actually crucial to the body's reaction to disease. Um, so we have trials going on at the moment where for cancer therapy, not only are we, are we using the, uh, the regular sort of chemotherapy or immune um, drugs now, uh, but we're combining that with um, fecal transplants and actually putting in a healthy microbiome into the patient. And it seems to act as an adjunct therapy. So the reaction to the main medication is much improved if you have a healthy gut flora as well. And again, simple, cheap, and it looks like being um, effective. At Parkwood Institute, we do a lot of work with um, brain trauma, and that includes PTSD. So uh, the hospital has contracts with the RCMP and with the uh, uh, Canadian Defence uh, Forces um, to look at clinics and interventions for service workers who have had uh, or are experiencing serious PTSD following their you know, professional um, duties. Uh, there's some real innovations coming out there now. Um, firstly, through stimulating the brain with um, short electrical pulses, which seems to sort of stabilize the brain centers that are responsible for the panic attacks. And one, one intervention I really like is actually being able to show the patient their brain biochemistry using MRI. So actually portraying it on a screen, the patient can see the brain patterns and as they start to feel the anxiety of a PTSD episode coming on, they can see how their brain biochemistry is changing. And then we ask them to now change that profile just by thinking, relaxing, whatever it work, works for you. Change that biochemistry profile you can see on the screen. And often they can. And now they're able to actually uh, come up with a strategy through their own thought processes to better control or, or, or avoid a PTSD episode. And they have documented evidence now from the science that this is actually gonna work, which gives them the confidence to do it. Also at Parkwood Institute, we are leaders in mental health. And it, particularly in the transition of an individual from the mental health system back into the community. Uh, this is led by Dr. Cheryl Forchuk, and she really focused on why is it that many patients who are discharged from our mental health care bounce back in quite quickly. And it, it, it's quite scary. Uh, for some individuals, it's actually been documented that as soon as they're discharged from the mental health facility, there are people out there waiting to, to meet them and bring them back into the sex trade or whatever. So it's a very vulnerable time for very vulnerable people. So the program has looked at how we can safely discharge patients back to the community. And this involves um, a providing a housing, a housing unit in partnership with the city. They can choose the housing unit online before they're discharged. Help with the financial self-sustainability of living independently. So being able to help them with their landlord to uh, transfer money for their rent, et cetera. If needed, have technology in their new housing unit, like a flat screen TV, where at the press of a button, that can actually get in touch with their health worker. That can actually help them manage if they're having a particular episode associated with their, their disease. What this does is substantially cut down the readmission rate for mental health patients into our um, uh, facilities. It's been so successful that this has now been adopted as the standard of care in a number of countries, including uh, NHS Scotland. And very recently, Dr. Forchuk wrote all of this up as a template in a book, uh, essentially a 101, how do you look after mental health patients following discharge from hospital? And that has now been adopted by the World Health Organization as the manual for this, uh, for this group of patients. So there's a great example of where we started off trying to help our own patients in London, and that actually now has translated into being the standard of care you know, across the world. Another innovation is in neurosciences, and um, for any of you who have worked with 
individuals or no individuals who've had Parkinson's disease, it's, it's not just the, the issue of failing speech and, um, and tremor, it, it really seriously harms mo motility and, and mobility. And if you lose your mobility, then your quality of life is substantially reduced. You simply can't go out for a walk, for instance. So um, Dr. Manda Jog, who works at University Hospital, has come up with a, a, uh, an intervention which involves a small implant at the back of the neck which sends little electrical impulses into the spinal cord. And this seems to overcome the adverse sort of tremor and mobility issues of Parkinson's, such that the individuals are able now to actually go out, be mobile, go for walks. They might need the assistance of a walker, but at least they're outside. So a real improvement in quality of life through, uh, through a, basically a, you know, a new discovery, a new tech, a new device that will help these individuals. Now on children's, children's research, traditionally we were very strong on neonatology and um, you know, in making sure that premature babies uh, you know, could survive at a very early um, age uh, following premature birth. And London was the first center to discover the importance of a chemical in the lungs called surfactants. Um, and in premature babies, this, 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 this molecule is, is not mature. Uh, the lungs don't work properly, and babies, premature babies, have very you know serious uh, you know lung lung disease basically. But by understanding the nature of this biochemical surfactant, it can be inhaled into the baby's lungs. The lungs work better, and it helps them to remain fit until they were they are of an age where they can actually come out of the the, the incubator. That's not the only type of research we do. So. More recently, we started to look at the environment um, and how that relates to childhood health. Because if you have adver adverse health in childhood, that's probably gonna go with you through the rest of your life. So understanding childhood disease and how it can intervene is really going to protect that individual potentially for the rest of their life and save the health system an awful lot of money. So one thing we published in the last year was looking um, at air quality in Southwest Ontario and correlating that with the incidence of asthma in children. And what we found is where the air quality is poorest, and in our region, it's actually Sarnia, there is a much increased rate of asthma in children. Um, so that's not a matter of, you know, the answer there isn't to give inhalers to the children, it's to clean up the air quality in Sarnia. Um, so a great example of how, by looking at the environment and green technologies, we can, um, we can have a real impact on, on health of children and the future health of them as, as adults. A lot of the work we do is enabled by high technology. Um, it's expensive but we are, they are facilities that are used not just in London, but throughout the region and, and, and far beyond. Um, and one of the things that we have in London that's a huge asset is we have um, a cyclotron. Now, a cyclotron is a machine that makes radioactive isotopes. You can then tag to molecules for a diagnostic imaging. So you use these in things like um, uh, 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 CT, in MRI, and when we put a radioactive molecule in there as well, it's called PET, positron emission tomography. So you can have PET CT or PET MRI. We have all of those technologies in Lawson. And what it means is that we can make radioactively tagged biomarkers that can exquisitely, exquisitely localize disease tissues through non-invasive imaging. So in the past, whereas you might have needed actually a tissue biopsy, to diagnose a problem, say, with the liver or the kidney, we can now get that information non-invasively through advanced imaging using things like, like, like PET-CT, for instance. So we have, um, uh, it's very useful for cancer therapy because obviously imaging and really identifying the nature of a cancer is crucial to selecting the right therapy. And every night, at uh, Grosvenor Street in a bunker under the parking lot there, 
the cyclotron is producing radioactive glucose. Um, the run starts at 4 a.m. every day. By 7 a.m., we have the isotope. We've completely cleaned it up such that it's suitable to inject individuals. And then it goes out to the cancer center in London and the cancer center in Windsor for the patients that will receive that diagnostic imaging that particular day. And then come the evening, we start all over again because the isotopes are very short half life. We want them to clear from the body quickly. And so we have to do this every single day uh, as an important diagnostic imaging for our um, local community. So the next, the next um, target, or one of the next targets that's gonna come out of our imaging expertise is called Theranostics. And Theranostics is where you don't just image disease, but you actually use the imaging to treat the disease as well. And what we can do is take that same radioactive tag molecule that will localize, say, to a tumor and show us where it is. We could also now attach radioactive particles to that molecule that will not only show us where the cancer is, it'll start to kill the cancer. So these are things using radioactive alpha particles, very high energy, but very small penetration. So it might kill tissue within two or three millimeters, but it won't extend outside of that. So if now if we can target molecules, particularly say to a, to a particular tumor like prostate cancer, we can not only image it, we can treat it at the same time, and then we can do a longitudinal assessment and make sure when we have actually eradicated that tumor um, and we don't need to do actually do the, the treatment regime anymore. So that's called Theranostics. And that's something that we want to hopefully implement uh, at a clinical trial level in, in, in the next year. So finally then, we're not just a sort of, you know, non-for-profit research um, uh, center, we're actually also a business. So I gave you an example of how we make radioisotopes every night for uh, uh, cancer imaging out of our cyclotron facility. Um, that runs as a business um, and it has to actually uh, uh, at very least break even um, because when we can't afford to subsidize the health system, but we actually don't wanna make a profit out of it. So that is a business, it's not for profit business. We also use our imaging um, uh, equipment in the off hours, particularly things like weekends where there's less of a patient need uh, to run a veterinary service. We run Thames Valley Veterinary Services, which offers diagnostic imaging and some treatments to, uh, to household pets uh, because there's nowhere else in Southwest Ontario that this can be done. It used to be done in Guelph, but now it's, uh, it can only be done uh, you know, by us in, in, in London. Um, we have the clinical trials facilities where we partner with industry to test new drugs and devices. That brings in about $13 million a year in, uh, in income from those partnerships with industry, uh, which you know, not only pays for the trial, but also supports some of the support services that we need to do those trials. So it's a contribution back to pharmacy, uh, to nursing, to labs, um, et cetera. Uh, we also, little, I don't think it's particularly well known, but we have a prototyping facility in uh, Grosvenor Street. Uh, where individuals can actually build prototypes of um, electrical devices or mechanical devices um, ready for you know, testing either in a preclinical context in animals or in, into a first in human testing facility. And we're really open to partnerships in the use of, uh, of, the, of that facility for, uh, for other uh, businesses around the region that uh, might find that uh, valuable for their own business plans. Uh, Software development is increasingly important, and particularly for something like imaging, where perhaps 50% of the definition now you get from a medical image is not what the camera told you, it's what the software then interprets from what the camera told you. So software development is increasingly important for um, definition of disease um, out of uh, diagnostic imaging, for instance. Uh, Together with Western, we run a business development office called World Discoveries. It's in the research park at Western. And that's our office that our investigators um, take new discoveries, 
They, uh, the office does the searching of, is this really novel? Is it patentable? If it is, then we'll um, do go through the patenting process and then look out for partners, usually industry partners that will now invest in the technology and take it to the next stage of development and through to, uh, you know, to human um, testing. That, that World Discoveries Unit, uh, just for our hospital-based um, innovations, generated $6.6 .6 million last year in, in income. So looking to the future then, um, one thing that's really holding us back is the amount of money that Canada invests in R&D, including health. So for the, you know, for our international competitors, so if you look at something like the uh, Organization of Economic Cooperation Development, OECD, uh, most countries would invest two to 3% of their uh, GDP into um, R&D. Uh, Canada only once got up to 2%. And since 2000 until now, it's consistently fallen every year. And it's down now down about 1.5%. So our real problem is that our scientists are as good as anybody else's in the world, if not better, but the amount of resources we have to work with is um, about three times less than the UK and about seven times less than the US. And so we really cannot you know, fulfill our potential in health R&D because the core investment, particularly from the federal government, is not there to maximize um, that talent. So that's the cautionary note. Uh, we do great things, we could do so much more if in fact we had an innovative national government that actually was prepared to put this as a priority. Uh, that the health of the nation was something that was worth investing in, even at least uh, as little as you know 2% of, of, uh, of GDP per year. So going forward, um, areas we're concentrating on, I told you, treat, treatment for cancers through things like theranostics, uh, preventing and delaying dementia, that's becoming an increasing health problem. Uh, we are um, partnering with pharmaceutical companies to look at the latest interventions to try and slow down things like um, Alzheimer's um, disease. As we move more and more away from hospital care and more to sort of care at home or care in the community, there's a whole new research area that's opened up around technology assisted home care, which we've already applied to mental health, but now we could apply to many other uh, situations as well. And that includes being able to measure all of your health information remotely. So your blood pressure, your oxygen tension, your blood biochemistry, how can we measure that in a person's home? through wearable devices and the information then transmitted back you know, to the data center in, in the hospital. Uh, rehabilitation and mobility is a big focus because in terms of quality of life, losing your mobility is one of the biggest setbacks you never have. The longer we can keep people mobile, the happier they're gonna be and the more productive they're gonna be. So finally, if you ask me if there's one thing I would really like in the next year that would really set us on the right course, I'd say a national health vision. We have 13 provinces and territories, all with their own interpretation of what health support should be. Um, we have no national idea that encompasses that. We have no national plan that a federal government can plug itself into. So if we're looking for something to come out of the pandemic with that will really put us all on the same page and working to something for the future, please let's have a national health care plan. And I'll stop there and invite questions. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Um, actually, we, we gave you a little bit more time to speak. You unfortunately okay. were very interesting, but went beyond our regularly scheduled time. Can we ask you to stick around till the top of the hour and answer questions Absolutely. then? Absolutely. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, so we will try to continue with the regular program right now. Um, the first of all, Dr. Hill, um, it was a great presentation, a great discussion. Unfortunately, your PowerPoint didn't work, but you don't need PowerPoint to talk about Lawson. So uh, I learned more about Lawson in the last 
45 minutes than I knew about Lawson having lived in the London area for the last uh, 40 years. Uh, so it was a great presentation, very informative. Um, on behalf of your present, or on behalf of the Rotary Club of London, and in recognition of your presentation today, a contribution has been made to the Polio Plus Foundation of Rotary International to immunize 50 infants against polio. And I don't know if you heard a little bit earlier, Rotary is very engaged in the eradication of polio. So because of you, Rotary, Rotary is one step closer to a polio-free world. Um, I then have some announcements for the club. So the first one, Jim Belton, please. Jim, you'll have to unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Don. Uh, the Jack Burkhart Community Service Above Self Award uh, recognizes a member of the Rotary Club of London who is involved uh, in activity in the community as a volunteer in non-Rotarian activities and secondarily is an active member within the Rotary Club of London. Uh, it's uh, open to all current active and satellite active members uh, in the club. And uh, also uh, for eligibility, any member in the club, be they active or satellite active, including the board, uh, except for those who've received the uh, uh, recognition in the past. And they are listed on the nomination form. So if you go to look for the nomination form, uh, you find it on our website homepage. Under homepage, down, download files, it's there. Uh, we would like to have the nominations back to us uh, by Monday, the 11th of uh, March. And if you could uh, get that back to me, then I will take them on to the, uh, uh, to the board meeting. Uh, so the Burkhart Award, looking for nominations. And uh, again, it's for Rotarians who have been active in the community and non-Rotarian uh, activities. Well, thank you. Jim Swan, would you like to talk about this wonderful event? I can do that. I see that you have the, uh, the rough draft of our poster that we just sent off to uh, the graphics people to, to finalize and, and uh, make good. So put May the 6th on your uh, calendar uh, so that you can take part in the Rotary Ranch Party. Uh, great music and entertainment at all. But we're going to be needing um, uh, someone to uh, drive... Uh, sponsorships and uh, auction items for the event that will be a fundraiser. It has uh, uh, raised funds in the past uh, as the East Coast Kitchen Party and the Rotary Ranch Party will do the same. And we think that it's going to be a great time to uh, break out. Uh, everybody is ready to put all the world worries on the shelf for at least one night and have a rootin' tootin' good time uh, at the Rotary Ranch. So uh, if, um, if you want to step forward as someone who can help coordinate the auction items, uh, ticket sales, and or uh, uh, seek sponsorships, we want to hear from you. But in the first instance, put May 6th on your calendar and get your cowboy on. The next item is a quick announcement. Uh, we talked about this last week. The Rotary Learning and Information uh, Leadership Institute uh, the part two of that training program will be starting later this month. You have one week to register. Um, information is in our club runner, as well as I believe it was all sent out to all Rotarians via email a couple of weeks ago. And another one that I talked about, it's in our the COG as well. Uh, the district is looking for a number of different uh, positions to be filled, uh, youth protection officer, training team leader, and well as redefining club service committee. Uh, there's more information on the uh, in it, the COG or on the district website about these roles. And Randy, you have a, a question? Actually, I have an announcement uh, related to youth exchange. Uh, this morning, I heard from Ian Wright. Uh, he will be our youth exchange counselor uh, coming forward. I'm going to continue with um, as youth exchange officer. And we've had our exchange student um, um, uh, 
provided us, uh, Nadia uh, Yurt, spelled J-U-R-T. She's from Switzerland and she will be coming in in August. She speaks German, French, and English. She's very athletic, as you can imagine, coming from Switzerland. She knows how to ski. Um, she practices uh, keto. Uh, she's very involved with archery. When she comes to Canada, she wants to learn how to play basketball. I think we'll change that to hockey um, uh, as we go along here. But um, uh, she's also very, um, very good um, uh, at school, and she plays the transverse flute. I'll let you look that up in, in Google. So thanks very much. Wonderful. Thank and that is it for our meeting this week. Thank you very much, everyone. And a reminder that we serve to change lives.